Hello, friends, and welcome to your Daily Detroit. It is Monday, June 12th, 2023. I'm Jer Stays, and joining me online is... Fletcher Sharp. Now, we've got a ton of stories to get through today. One is actually not in the sports docket, because I think it's just worth a big mention. It is something that I have smelled for years as a Detroiter, and I am very personally glad that it is gone. The Detro- The smokestack for the Detroit incinerator came down over the weekend to a large boom very early on Sunday morning. Uh, I couldn't be happier that it's done. I mean, obviously, the, the place has been d- shut down since 2019. It is probably one of Coleman Young's uh, very controversial things and decisions that he made to really push this incinerator through in the uh, mid-80s at a cost of like half a billion dollars. And I would say that um, of all the things that he's done, this is one that's pretty clear to argue that it, that it was a boondoggle. It it just did not do great for Detroit residents. And whether it's the emissions or the smells or whatever, I am glad to see that tower go as the end of an era. You know, I remember living on a street where I could see the tower at the end of it. And I'm so glad that future generations that live on that street will not see that tower. It did not smell good growing up. And I'm glad that a lot of people growing up now did not really have to understand how how bad the smell was in the area um my cons- i was glad to see it go down my only concern was the fact that while it has not been used since 2019 um there's still stuff in there so when it was imploded a lot of people were saying you know make sure you stay safe maybe stay inside for the next few hours i know it was imploded at basically 6 a.m but like i know some people had to go to work i know some people had to just be out and doing things some people were on their way back from work just I'm glad that no one was seriously like impacted by the chemicals for, cause like that's, that's not, you don't want to be like, yay, it's done. And all of a sudden you have pneumonia from whatever was inside of there. The legacy of these smoke stop towers being built in neighborhoods for people who, you know, maybe don't need those built in there, maybe leaving some long economic, socioeconomic damage done. Um, it's good to see that we're finally getting away from that to some degree because it's not, like you said, it wasn't one of Coleman A. Young's uh, finest, finest moments for the city. And I saw one of the clips, and I remember seeing it. It was actually a younger Jim Fouts, of all people, mayor of, or at the time, council person for Warren, and like how much of an issue this was. And for people to get a little bit of context, I mean, there's a bunch of listeners who were not alive when this happened. I mean, I was I was a kid when this thing was built, and all I can remember is the smell that sometimes would come to the east depending how it blew. Or, you know, when I lived in Midtown, there would be times where, or in Lafayette Park, there would be times where, well, this is not a barbecue day, right? Because it's there. No matter what, like, official set or whatever, when you live there, you know, like, what it is, right? And it's so, it was always a source of consternation. And and frankly, like, you know, it, it took away from the pride of the city as well, beyond all the health effects. It's just gross. Yeah, you don't really want to say, come to our city, and people get in, and they're like, what's that smell? And you're like, oh, it's just a smokestack. I'll get used to it. You should never have to say it just about something like that. So I'm glad that like that, that's now going away, because yikes. If you've got any stories or things like that, hit us up, dailydetroit at gmail.com. Let's get into a little bit of sports. I think first off, one of there is the loss of one of the Detroit, well, I guess loss of a job. We don't know what's happening next with them. Detroit reporting crew or based out of Detroit reporting crew for The Athletic, Bill Shea has been laid off along with like around 20 other journalists at the publication that was recently purchased by the New York Times. And uh, I mean, it always sucks to see someone lose their job. But an even bigger conversation out of this that I noticed in the coverage of it is they're mentioning in the reporting that the American football and the English Premier League, but really a lot of the NFL just dominates the sports coverage and they're moving to a much more league focused thing. And it just something as somebody who does local work and you do local sports work and this is our world to see so much of local going away that there are so few of us left that do any semblance of real local stuff, you know? And it's, it's kind of sad to see as somebody who grew up with like the beat writers and, and all that other stuff. And I know there's other changes happening, but I want to run it by you first, Fletcher. To watch from the, the, my journalism growth from the beginning of journalism school to even now, and even from being a kid, just reading sports pages to now, it's so wild to see how many, how the faces have changed and how the scope of things that are being covered has changed just because 
people don't care about the other stuff, other stuff as much as they did before. It's more about, you know, some people care more about off season, you know, training reports than like some teams that have current seasons going on. And it's just kind of wild to see. Like, I understand as people grow to love things, like it evolves and like they want more and more stuff. But it, it feels like Thanos, you know, like it feels like inevitable that like literally every sport will be gone except for American football. Like every, it will be at this point, everyone will be talking about only football, like no soccer, no basketball, no baseball, no, just football. And then that's it. And like, it's, it's wild to just see that this is the way they're moving. And like, it's, you would have never thought this five, 10 years, well, maybe five, but 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't have thought this, but now it's like, it, I, I don't know what they can, what can be done to like, you know, even slow this a little bit. First off, I do think that as much as I love baseball, it is in a march of slow decline. I like some of the changes they've made, but I don't know if how many more generations baseball like lasts as a major thing because it just doesn't have the interest. And and just looking underneath the, the hood here, I tell you, you know, Fletcher, you and I make active decisions about this. But if you and I had decided that, hey, every Monday we're just going to talk about the Lions, I'm sure we double or triple our numbers. And it's just kind of uh, like, well, everyone else does it, so why should why should we do it too? You know, from from our perspective. And I know that that's kind of a niche thing to do that we have a privilege to do because we kind of run the ship and we don't have giant corporate overlords. But uh, it's stunning, and it it really makes you think and gives you pause. That's kind of why we we don't do it is because while I, while I would love to f- do a few things about the Lions, like literally as you think of a thought, there's like three or four podcasts that have like literally sprouted that same. It's like they're, everything's being done with that. It's being covered to such an extent where like there really isn't any room to like break in and do something where it's like, all right, well, there are things that deserve more coverage here, more things that can be shown that have not been talked about with these other teams, these other things in the city. So like, let's focus on these things. But yes, to your point, if we really wanted to sit down and say we could cover Lions offseason training, what colored cleats is this? People would t- we dub- people would tune in immediately. They'd be like, oh, my God, this person has what color laces? We could do 10 minutes on Fletcher Sharp's sharpest cleats and which cleats that you think look the best. And it would get double the downloads. In a way, it's funny to make that joke, but also like it's not funny because it it feels not like a joke at all. Um, but it's I mean, I, I understand football's, football's got a great, very big hold. I used to play, I, I've mentioned it many times. I used to play it growing up and just, I can't watch it as much because all those big hits that you see people deliver and like take, I, I used to be like, yeah. And now I'm like, oh, I used to take hits like that. And now my body, my body makes noises when it gets really cold. Uh, um, so yeah, I see some hits like that and it makes me like cringe where I'm like, ah, I hope he's okay. Like, oh, I'm, I'm more concerned about his his life as opposed to him picking up 45 yards and a first down. But I understand that some people are like, hey, it, it's, it's the last sport of modern gladiators. It's the last sport where people can go out there and show how tough they are by, you know, running over somebody or getting stiff armed to Hades and back. So like, yeah, I... I don't see the hold of it ever being released on this country. I mean, a good point I, I made off air. I've seen multiple people be like, well, I'm not watching. I'm protesting this. And that's totally fine to have your morals and your rights. But every single person who says that, there's like at least seven more who are like, okay, well, I'll watch for you. The people on the left and the people on the right, like people are like, oh, hey, I'm not watching it because it's too violent or I don't want my kids to play it. Or on the other side, oh, the flag kneeling, whatever. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of people to replace them. It's funny to watch the discourse of that online where people are like, I'm not watching. And people on both sides are like, ah, ah, cry about it. And it's like, yeah, it's the one thing that unites everybody is like making fun of people who won't watch the sport because everybody is making fun of somebody. And it's always like along the same lines. I think key to all of this is making sure that there is a model that works for local media. You know, for us, it's been it's been podcasting and, you know, doing, you know, the occasional video thing or whatever, because there is this shift and I can say that in my career, it's been marked and I'm in the the transition period of people just don't like there's no money to be made on text anymore unless you're doing it like yourself. And it's a very bespoke thing or it's a niche thing. The reality is, is attention is now all about audio and video. It's all about podcasts. It's all about TikTok. And that's one thing that I've really realized that I need to do more on because 
like I have been at family gatherings now and it's gone to the point where it's like the 55, 60 year old uncles are now on TikTok. They're watching more TikTok than they are TV. And it's not that it is changing. It has changed. And I think everybody else in legacy media is trying to catch up to it. It's really wild to see that. It's kind of how Twitter kind of came on onto the stage and became like the big network for how people got news. Like there are people who are like, I don't read the newspaper. I get my news from Twitter. I used to laugh at them until I realized like social media in that respect would get you the news faster than say a newspaper because it happens immediately. That's also why some people spread some information, misinformation because it happens so immediately. You don't have to wait for print You just put it out there and it's there. And even if you delete it, it's still kind of there. And TikTok's kind of becoming the, the, the video version of that where it's like, I, someone's like, I learn about history through these TikTok threads. And I was like, all right. But then I look at a few of them and I'm like, well, I see how you could learn from this. Cause this is pretty in depth, but also you own this book. Why don't you just open it? They're like, well, it's easier to have them read it to me. Okay. I can't, I can't argue with that. Yeah. You can't, you can't fight what people clearly prefer to do, like from a business perspective. And I think that's underpinning the whole, like local journalism, local media, all this other stuff. That's what's underpinning it is that you can't fight a, a battle that requires sound and words and everything else with text. You're not going to win the sports that adapt best to it. And you know what? The football adapts very well to it. Why? The plays are very short. They have beginnings. They have ends. They can easily be clipped. You can easily put that out there. You know, sports like baseball where, you know, things can kind of drag on for a few innings. It's more about strategy. Those just aren't going to work well in a TikTok era. And also people love commercials and football is full of commercials. Uh, soccer, for example, there's commercials at the beginning of the game, the middle of the game and the end of the game. <laughs> but there is like a 45 plus minute periods of time where there's just only game. Same with baseball, where an inning can be very short, but an inning can also be very long. There's nothing to take your attention away from that. Football, they have timeouts, they have official timeouts. They have injury time. It's like all this time you need to like make sure you can get up and go do something and come back. And to my my belief in that regard, it's kind of why people like college basketball in that way, where it's like there's a lot of time breaks where we can do something, stop, get up and go do something and then come back or stop, watch a commercial, readjust or something. It's I can do process this in short amount of time, short amount of time and then be able to like go forward with it and have information and go from there. Football is TikTok. That's it. Uh, we, we've nailed it. And I promise you, the next two stories are going to be about baseball and Detroit City FC. And let's just jump right into that with the Detroit Tigers, because we have a Jave Baez problem. Yeah, I I don't ever want to talk harshly about professional athletes as much as I can, because I know they're trying. I know that they have lives. They're also people. But man, he he kind of sucks right now. And like, I don't really have any other words to say that except for kind of sucks like yes he has 29 rbi to lead the tigers that's great uh he has 74 total bases which is also great but he's swinging at pitches that have no hope of going across the plate and like it'd be one thing if he was you know first second third year player he's not he's for a while every pitcher knows you throw him a slider he it's gonna be an out and he has not improved that at all and it's starting to hurt the team not just that, but I know earlier the base running incident, they had to pull him out of the game because he just wasn't paying attention. Like, these things add up, and, like, it worries me that they committed so much money to somebody who, like, is not really improving. We are in the last 10, one win, nine losses. I look at this, and it just hurts because our division is terrible, right? The Twins are leading our division with a 500 record. We could just win a couple more of those games, and we would be very much closer to the hunt. Now we're only five and a half out in a terrible division. So it is possible to catch up, but like it, we need to really start to turn, turn the table on this. If we want to like, it would, it would be terrible to be in the basement of a division that is the basement. And if the top is getting 500, I feel like any halfway ba decent baseball team can hit 500. And if that's your division title, then I will gladly take that home and whatever I'll take whatever qualifiers you want to give me. It's a division title. And it's just frustrating to see like the easy opportunity right there, just like slipping through our fingers and uh, no one's expecting the world out of these guys. But if we could be not one in nine in our last 10, and this isn't the only time the season we've done that, we would be in a lot better position. No, like no one's expecting him to go out there and say, all right, go win the pennant now. Like now go do that now. We're like, hey, just compete and do the best you can. And also if you're in a really bad division, 
maybe, you know, maybe try to win it. And they, like you said, they have a horrible record. Horrible. But they're still five and a half away from, you know, potentially leading the division or being tied. And that's wild. That's such a wild thing to realize. Yeah, they're 26 and 37 as we're recording this. Because everyone in their division, even Minnesota, who have a run differential in the positive, the only team that does, everyone else is in the negative. Some by 18, one by 102. It's there. I don't really have any more proper words except for mind-boggling. We, we need to sort out why why they're hitting so poorly, besides the fact that they're just not good hitters. That's not. I don't think that's always the case. And like try to fix it and, and make ramifications because or make rectifications because the season's not over like, again. Like if I think they win the division, are they going to do make noise in the playoffs? Probably not. No, probably not. But at least making it at this point, like it's close enough to. It's not like the Pistons where the Pistons are like, all right, we're we're rebuilding. We have a very bad team. We have a lot of young stars. We don't expect to compete. Whatever. I'd change my note about that if they were in their division and their division was like this division where it's like, all right, well, you're seven games back, but also the leader of your division is a game under 500. Then I'm like, all right, go win your division then. We, we got to got to our stars hidden, man. Like I can excuse Miguel Cabrera having an off hitting because, you know, he's this is his 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 swan song. He's he's done after this. He's doing the best he can. Hand eye coordination isn't what it used to be. I understand. But your star who's hitting second. You you gotta not do that, man. That that that's not acceptable. Let's keep it going with a nil nil draw between Detroit City FC and Charleston Battery down in Charleston. Weather made it for a very late start, so I ended up watching the first half live, second half on replay. That late start helped eliminate basically the home advantage for Charleston because there was no crowd there. Look, road tie against the second team in the conference. I'll take it. Yeah, I was worried they're going to walk into Charleston and get punched in the face by Ben Pierman. I was super certain of that. I was like, all right, well, kind of riding high off this trade. Tommy McCabe has finally turned it around. He's doing some good things for the team, and they're going to get down there, go to play, and Ben's going to be like, hey, nice to see you guys. Uh, hold these eight goals real quick. I was very worried about that. It did not happen, which is good. What did, what did happen that is good? Dom Gasso came in for the last 30 minutes for Lay Jope, and he played great, which is great considering that he's filling in for, for Tommy McCabe eventually. 19-year-old, only played, I think, total of seven senior games in the last two years. So to see him step in in like an actual crunch moment, game tied 0-0 late and play as well as he did, that's very good. Dario, I'm gonna the jury's out on him because, again, first game he came in late sub, it's just go in there and do something. And even though he didn't really have a, a stellar substitution appearance, uh, he put some spark in there. And like the thing I talked about with a few people off air, if you're going to be a bad team, at least bring in people who are going to make people go, wow, and be excited about it. Look, Fletcher, this is a game I think we could have won. Ben Morris, that ball goes a little bit different. We're up one nothing, Three points. Yeah, he had a chance in the first half where it came right to him. And people were remarking like, oh, the keeper, Trey Muse, made a great save. He kicked it right at his arm. He had the entire net, the entire net, the entire, I'm not even hyperbole. The entire net was available. Trey Muse stuck out his arm, his thin arm, six foot thin arm. And Ben kicked it right at his, at, at his elbow. And I won't repeat what I said in a live time because we're not that type of show, but it was not nice. And I, I, I looked and I'm like, there's no other starting forward in this league who would have done that. And someone mentioned before Francis Tuahene, former player. They're like, well, maybe Francis would have scored. I don't think Francis would have scored that. But I will say this. Francis would definitely have at least a goal or two assists at this point of the season right now. His best attribute, his best game of the year would not be the game where he took two shots on goal. That would not be his best contribution to this team so far. Francis would have done something else besides that. So I think Dario... Let's Ben start for a little bit. I think he gets one or two more games, maybe one, because I know they play Hartford next, and Hartford are bleeding goals defensively. So if you can't go down there and accidentally find your way into a goal at Hartford, who are also struggling, maybe your time is to be on the bench, man. Like maybe it's time for you to like take a breather, let someone else go out there, do something. You come in late, and then you're the change pace guy. Because you can't make the playoffs missing chances like that. Like, that's not acceptable. And I know, like, right now, for Detroit, it's just 
get out of the weeds, get back into, you know, some familiar territory, get back to playing the game, you know, but if you're going to keep tying like that's, I know it's a tie and a tie away against a really good team is great. That was supposed to be a win. And I'm not, I'm not saying that before the schedule, but I'm saying after the game was played, you had the far more dangerous chances and you just didn't, conver- that's supposed to be a win. Those are games you look back on when you miss the playoffs by one or two points. And you're like, wow, we should have won that. That would have been something different now. Like, obviously, you losing one game does not, or you tying a game does not dictate the rest of your season. But, like, it's a couple bumps in the road where you can look back and be like, that's why our car is so dinged up. We hit the most bumpy road possible. And, like, the last pothole didn't do your car in, but, like, all the other ones before it definitely did not help. Well, I want to see a W against Hartford Athletic because that will help ensure that we are not in the basement. I want to see a win in Hartford and my... Best hope would be for a tie in Memphis. Yeah, Hartford, like I said, they're kind of spinning out. I really feel bad for Antoine Hopeno. I know he wanted to go home, and like watching him on the field, he just looks like a different person than I saw last year entirely. He does not have that youthful spark that he had before. He looks like Antoine lost Hopeno. I, I I feel for him. I do. Um, but it might need to feel for him a bit longer after you know he loses three nothing this Wednesday. Um, the weekend, uh, I would have loved if Memphis kept Philip Goodrum, which is something I never thought I'd say, because he really wanted to leave. And once he left Memphis, they looked a lot better and he looked a bit better in Tulsa. So like, yeah, uh, a road draw for Mem- against Memphis would be great. Um, they are, they're still figuring some stuff out, but like they're playing better ball. Um, so here's the hoping that going in there, you can get a result that's positive as opposed to, you know. Last time you're in Memphis, which was a three to one loss, very unceremoniously being dumped out of the playoffs. Yeah, that was not fun to watch in person, but it was a great time. <laughs> I think DCFC is on the right path. I just think they need to, they need to finish. And I know like that sounds very simple. I know we said it multiple times. They just need to finish. They need to score goals. Um, turn those ties into wins and those losses into ties. Hundred percent. Before I let you go, I wanted to mention really quick. Uh, Longtime Detroit City FC player Cyrus Sadie has poked his head back up. He is playing ball again. Yeah, he's playing for Liquid Football of the Michigan uh, uh, Premier Soccer League, or Midwest Premier Soccer League. Um, if you would like to watch him in person, you can get over to Liggett, uh, where Liquid plays their home games, and you can watch a few more former DCFC players. Uh, Bosch and Benny Tanyi, the brothers Tanyi, are also playing for Liquid Football. All right, well, Fletcher Sharp, so good to talk to you. You can find him on Twitter at SaintFDW. And, of course, if you've got feedback for the show, leave an email or a voice memo, dailydetroit at gmail.com. So good to talk to you, sir. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. With that, I'm Jair Stays. Thank you so much to our members, patreon.com slash dailydetroit, for keeping local coverage alive. You are the absolute best. With that, I am Jair Stays. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit.